Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you're having a good time. It seems like you are, from what I can tell. Um, and this time, as, as Chris uh, said, I'm going I'm to talk about some of the neat things you can do with these, uh, these strange structures that I was telling you about yesterday. Um, and I've given this talk, you can see the title, Light and Matter in a Tight Space. So we we're able with these fibers to take, take a beam of light and put it into a very small space, a very small area, and keep it there for a long time. And in some cases, that little area can be hollow, so we can put, we can put things into the hollow space with the light. This could be a gas, it could be a small particle, it could be all sorts of things. And we can get a very strong interaction between the very bright light and whatever you put into that small space. So you're kind of squeezing both, not just the light, but also matter into a small space. And this, this allows you to do some quite, quite beautiful things. So my first topic, um, I've got a series of examples of the kinds of things you can do. Uh, a lot of this is fun. Some of it has important applications. But um, mostly this is driven by curiosity, basically, what would happen if we did this or did that. The first thing has to do with um, propelling small particles of matter with light, and, uh, or laser-driven particle accelerators. So you can, you can take a very tiny particle and use a laser beam to make it go very fast. Um, I discovered that magazine cover uh, on the web. It's a, it's a magazine published in the US, I believe, 100 years ago, Science and Invention. And I couldn't believe the picture on the front. This guy looks extremely content with, <laughs> with, his, with his bottle helmet. And he's apparently, apparently being propelled by light, it looks. I don't know, it looks like light to me. Though looking at the way those beams are, he should be rotating rather fast in, in a very dangerous and unpleasant way. <laughs> but anyway, so this is about using light to push matter around, but not matter as big as he would be. So this is about pushing small particles. And how does this actually work? Well, you may or may not know that photons, these are the individual particles of light, which I'm not going to talk much about. I'm not going to do quantum optics. You have some other lectures on quantum optics, treating light as a series of small particles. But you can think about each of the photons of light as having a certain amount of momentum. And you know that if momentum hits something, it gives you some force. It, makes, it pushes that object, uh, makes it accelerate slightly if a particle hits something. So you can think about photons in exactly the same way. So we could imagine you have an, a number n photons per second in a laser beam coming in and hitting a particle. Some of those photons will get reflected, so we get a certain fraction, rho, the reflectivity of the ones that come backwards, and a certain number will be transmitted with t or tau being the transmission coefficient. And we can work out simply by that ratio of uh, reflected photons and transmitted photons, we can work out the optical force that acts on the particle. Turns out to be a very simple expression involving the power of the laser light, the, uh, re re the coefficient of reflection here, this, this, this rho factor, the refractive index of the material you're in here, and w over the speed of light. Very simple expression. So when you have a simple expression like that, it's, it's nice to put some numbers in and work out what kind of acceleration a small glass sphere might experience if you put a certain amount of power in. So here's some numbers. If you take a glass sphere of diameter 5 micrometers, again, this is about this much. If you remember my lecture yesterday, it's about that much. Not that much, but... Uh, um, and you have a power of 100 milliwatts. It's not very much, 100 milliwatts. And these, these bulbs up here are probably a couple of hundred watts. Um, reflectivity of 90%, which is not unreasonable. Refractive index 1, so we're doing this in air or in vacuum or something like that. You end up with an acceleration on that small particle of... 400 times that of gravity. That's a pretty serious amount of acceleration. It would be extremely unpleasant if you were the particle experiencing 400 g. Um, so, although, uh, <laughs> although the, um, this sounds enormously, this acceleration is extremely big. Remember, it's a very tiny particle, but it's being pushed around by light. Light, you think, weighs nothing. What, what, how, could, how is this possible? Well, it is possible, and, and you can do some quite remarkable things with it. This, by the way, has been known for quite some time, for several decades. Um, the very first experiments uh, on this 
uh, were carried out, I think, more or less in the first decade after the laser had been invented in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And it was mostly done by a guy called Arthur Ashkin, who worked at a very famous research laboratory called Bell Laboratory in the United States. Sadly, it doesn't exist anymore for various reasons. Um, it was kind of broken up into bits, and it's no longer anything like what it used to be. But at that time, it was very exciting to work there. And he discovered that if you had a laser beam, and you have a lens down here, and you focus the laser beam down to a small spot, just as you can do with a lens, that, the, that you find there may be some dust in the lab or something, things floating around in the lab in the dust, little particles. He found that he could trap small particles of dielectric material, that's to say bits of glass and transparent materials. He found that they became trapped just above the focus of the lens where it's at its maximum intensity. He found the particle got trapped there. The reason why it, it and it didn't move, it didn't get accelerated. It, it simply found a point where it stayed stationary. And the reason for this has to do with the propulsive force that we discussed on the previous slide, this, this, this particular one here. Turns out that that one is balanced by a trapping force that points slightly backwards. The rays of light come in, they bounce around inside the particle and come out at funny angles. Maybe some of you have studied the way a rainbow forms. Small particles of water, sunlight hits them, and you get colors, me scattering it's called, which create the colors of the rainbow. Well, the same thing happens here. Rays of light bounce around inside this small sphere and create a backward-going force, it turns out, because of the momentum of the photons. So it comes to a stop. And this is called a laser tweezer or laser tweezering. You can capture, for example, living cells, move them around in a liquid and look at them, make them spin, do all sorts of things. It's a very important and exciting field. Well, what we can do with the holocore fiber is something... A little different from this, although it's related. It's the, this is the kind of fiber I talked about yesterday, the hollow variety with nothing in the core, where the guidance mechanism, if you remember, was this photonic band gap I talked about. But the beautiful, beautiful thing about this structure is that here we can have diffraction-free propagation of light. Now, when I say diffraction-free, what I mean is that the laser beam no longer does this. Any kind of laser beam will always diffract, will always spread out as it travels. Or you could focus it with a lens, and then it'll spread out after it reaches the focus. You can't avoid that. It's, it's a basic, fundamental property of free space. But in the holocore fiber, we can forget about diffraction, and we can. this means that we can provide constant acceleration to a microparticle trapped in the holocore. Over tens, hundreds of meters, depending on how good the optical fiber is. You can guide light for long distances, and potentially trap a particle and accelerate it in the core. Well, it's nice to have that idea. It's also nice to be able to go in the lab and set up the experiment. So let me just explain the experiment that we set up now some years ago. Um, we find, uh, the, this, this is just a, just a sketch of it, we use a, a conventional laser tweezer beam to capture a small particle. That little yellow dot is the particle. And this is the, tr the tweezering beam coming in, a lens to focus it down. Particle is trapped and held in, in place by this tweezering beam. And we also have a white light source and a camera so we can see what's going on here. But we also have another beam coming in from the left here, which is the guiding beam. That's the beam that's going to push the particle into the hollow core and, and push it along, where the lack of diffraction, as I pointed out in the hollow core, means that the, that the acceleration experienced by the particle is constant. And it actually reaches a steady speed, just in the same way that if you fall out of an airplane, which not many of us do, I hope, very often, you will reach a terminal velocity of something like, I forget what it is, 60 miles per hour or something, I forget. Anyway, you reach a terminal velocity because the drag of the air, the viscosity of the air, prevents you from uh, going faster than a certain amount because the drag force depends on the velocity. It's exactly the same thing here. The drag force on the particle caused by the air in the hollow core, or maybe the liquid in the hollow core, if you put liquid in it, will, is counterbalanced by the force of the laser light, and the particle ends up going at constant speed. Now, if you had an empty core with nothing in it, no gas, nothing, the particle could end up going at a very high speed. Okay, let me show you one example. I'm going to show you two examples of things we can do with this. One is where the hollow core is filled with liquid. So we have a liquid filled 
hollow core for tonic crystal fiber. Easy to pump liquid in. You just have a pump and <laughs> pump the liquid in, and it fills up. One of the things you can do with this, and something that I was interested in doing for various reasons, is keeping a particle that's already inside the hollow core of the fiber, keeping it stationary, bringing it to a halt in one position, while it's being pushed by light from the left, in this case, but also we have a fluid flow in the opposite direction. So we deliberately um, pump some fluid in and keep it flowing at a constant rate uh, past the particle. And we can keep the particle stationary. That, that is of interest because you might, uh, for example, want to study uh, a living cell or maybe some small particle you're going to use for catalysis, something like that. Small particles are used in catalysis, cat catalytic converters, for example. You might want to keep it stationary, study it in great detail, the chemistry, the photochemistry, the, the way it fluoresces, that kind of thing. This is an ideal way to do that. So if you could actually do this, this would be very nice. Um, turns out that you can, indeed, um, do this. And here are the results of some experiments. Um, the axes here, this is the optical power, the power in the, in the light that's in the core, up to 150 milliwatts. And this is the pressure gradient. You know, if you pump liquid down a small tube, the pressure drops slowly as you go along the tube. This is kind of very simple fluid dynamics, the Poiseuille effect. So you need a certain pressure gradient to make the liquid flow. And by increasing the pressure gradient, we get a more rapid flow. And when you balance, say, 100 milliwatts against the flow, you can find a point, a combination of power, laser power, and pressure gradient where the particle becomes stationary. And this depends on the diameter of the sphere, of course. But you can do it. It works very nicely. Now, having done that, you might think of doing things like putting some chemicals into the fluid. This might be drugs, if you're looking in a biochemical system of some sort. It could be something to do with catalysis. You want to coat the particle with something. There are all sorts of opportunities here. But it, the important thing is it works. Now, in some experiments, we're interested not just in keeping it stationary, but pushing it along. And we might be interested in pushing the particle along maybe 10 meters of fiber. And that fiber might be going into some place where we can't get in there very easily. It might be in the middle of a block of concrete. You know, people often want to do that. They want to find out what's going inside some big piece of material. And you can't go in there, but you'd like to know what's happening in there. Um, so in, you can use particles maybe as a probe, as a sensor. Uh, but if you do that, you'd like to know where the particle is. It's not enough to know that it's kind of in there and it's being guided. You'd like to know exactly where it is at any given time. And that's difficult to do if you can't actually see it. But there is a trick one can use. One can use the Doppler effect. You're familiar with the Doppler effect, maybe mostly because of this guy, or guys like him who, who annoy your parents. Uh, maybe one or two of you can drive and being called in this way, I don't know. <laughs> it's all due to this guy. He's the guy who caused all the trouble. Christian Doppler lived a long time ago. And he realized that, uh, that if you have a wave coming along and hitting, being reflected off a moving object, that the frequency of the wave would either go up or go down, depending on whether the object was coming towards you or going away from you. Okay, you probably know this. Well, we can do this in the, the hollow core of the fiber. Here's the particle moving at some velocity in this direction. The laser light is coming in from here, goes into the core, it pushes, pushing the particle along. Some of that light is reflected, comes out of the core again, and this is a, what's called a beam splitter, which uh, a certain fraction of the light is reflected and some is transmitted. And some of the light here is also reflected off the end face of the fiber, so it doesn't have any, um, it doesn't have any frequency shift. So we, we're mixing light scattered off the moving particle that has a Doppler shift with light that's scattered off the end of the fiber that has no Doppler shift. We mix them on a simple photodiode. That's an op just a detector for light. And you pick up uh, a frequency, which is the Doppler shift. And it turns out that for these experiments, the Doppler shift is typically in the audio range. You can hear it. It's in the sort of range of 100 hertz, a couple of hundred hertz. You can hear it. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you, I hope, all, all being well. If the audio system is on, I didn't check it. Ah. Now, that is the actual sound that you hear on that photodiode, on that detector. Very spooky. I'm going to turn all the lights out and see if anyone screams. <laughs> 
And what you can see, this is the speed of the particle in micrometers per second. So it's going at about 200 micrometers per second. And given the particle is maybe five, five microns across, that's quite a lot of, quite fast for the particle. It doesn't sound very fast to us. The reason it goes up and down has to do with the excitation of higher order modes in the core that perturb the force acting on the particle. So it speeds up and slows down periodically. So, interesting. So you can listen to that frequency. You can simply measure it as a function of time and then you integrate frequency against time and you get position. Or you integrate velocity against time, you get position. So we can very accurately measure where the particle is. You can do other experiments here that are quite fun. You can, you can guide in two spheres rather than one. So previously it was one, so here we put two in. You, you pick one up, put it in, then pick another one up, pick it in, uh, put it in. So at the beginning of the experiment, they're sitting in this position with the light coming in. And uh, this, in fact, is a, a plot of the speed of the particles, a function of, of time um, along the fiber. This time, the particles are talking to each other. But how can they talk to each other? How can they do that? They're in different positions. And they're, they're not nothing special in the particles that could make them talk to each other. They're definitely doing it. So one of them speeds up, the other speeds up. They're having a conversation of some sort. I don't know what they're talking about. But it's quite clear there's something going on here. Now they're coming to a halt. Maybe they're having a fight. Oh, we go. <laughs> what is actually going on here is that, that this particle and this one, the, the, the light is being reflected from one to the other. And depending on exactly where the particle is, you get a slightly different pattern of light. about this in a sort of sense is that at the end of the, of the fiber here, they actually more or less get together. They reach agreement. After a lot of arguing, they reach agreement. See? <laughs> That's what's called perfect harmony, you see? <laughs> anyway, it's the end of the movie. No, let's stop. <laughs> So another experiment you can do with these holocore fibers um, involves doing it in a fiber that has no liquid. Those experiments were in a liquid-filled holocore where the particle moves really quite slowly because the drag force is very high. Um, you can do the same experiment, of course, in a, in a holocore that's filled with air. And it goes much more quickly in air. Instead of going at 200 micrometers per second, it goes at something more like a meter per second or one or two meters per second, so it goes really fast. Um, now, if you, want to, um, if you want to do an experiment on this, and you, you'd like to know how fast the particle is going, you'd like to know to measure its speed, it's going pretty fast, how would you do it? Well, if you didn't have that Doppler thing set up, then you'd do it in a very simple way. You'd make two marks on the fiber, two black marks with a pen, and you'd have a stopwatch. And you'd try to be as fast as possible, you know, because they're going really fast. And you know the distance, and you know the time, so... With a bit of luck and a very fast finger, you could, you could work out the speed. Okay, so this is what the student working on this decided to do, the PhD student, when he first got this to work. He didn't have the Doppler thing set up. And this is a picture, I'm going to show you a video of this. This is his experiment. This is the black mark made with a pen, whiteboard pen I think it was. Dimensions half a millimeter here. The light's coming in from the left. And in the movie, what you're going to see is the particle coming in, and this is the first black mark, so he's ready to measure the speed, and he's ready, no, it's really going to measure it. Ah! That's the particle scattering light. It just stops before the black mark. That's going five times slower. It just comes to a halt. It's sort of like bouncing off nothing. There's nothing there. It's just air. You know, there's, there's nothing. Why would it do that? Why would it suddenly stop and bounce and come back? The first time we saw this, we couldn't understand it at all. We, we discussed it for hours and tried to work out what was going on, and he ended up calling this fear of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> because the particle doesn't want to go past the dark mark. So what on earth is going on here? Well, actually, we know what's going on now, so I can kind of tell you what the answer is. The answer is we discovered a new kind of 
trap for, for particles. We call it an optothermal trap. And uh, I can't go into a lot of details here, but in, in essence, this picture shows you what's going on. Light is coming in. This is 100 milliwatts of light, which is quite a lot of light in this small core. The particles sitting here, this light gets scattered in all directions very strongly. In fact, you can see that in those videos. There's a lot of light being scattered off the particle. You can see that through the side of the fiber. And this light gets scattered. It sees the dark mark. It gets absorbed by the dark mark, the scattered light. It heats it up, heats the mark up, and it can heat it up by several tens of degrees, maybe even to 100 degrees, because quite a lot of power is hitting it and absorbs it very well. And then we end up with a temperature gradient. Here it's hot, and here it's cold. So the edge of the core has a hot region here and a cold region. You have a temperature gradient. And it turns out that there's a well-known effect in gases um, which causes molecules of gas to move from the cold region to the hot region. They hit the surface, hit a hot surface or a cold surface, and if there's a gradient in temperature, they get pumped from the cold to the hot region. So the, the gas is being pumped along the surface, and then it comes here where the temperature gradient goes to zero, and it turns around, comes back, and pushes against the particle, preventing it from moving. So the light is pushing from the left, and the gas flow is pushing from the right. Now, this is actually something called a Knudsen pump. He was a Danish scientist. I tried to find a picture of him, but there's only one on the web, and it's absolutely hopeless. It's like a black blodge or something. You, can't, you can hardly see his face, but um, very famous, actually. Knudsen pump. So this is what's causing this stable trapping position. And actually the thermal force, which is the, caused by the Knudsen pump, exactly balances the optical force. And as a result, the trapping, the position of the particle is pretty much independent of laser power, which is also bizarre. You turn up the power, it doesn't do anything. The particle doesn't move. And this, uh, this guy, Olli Schmidt, who does the experiments, did some modeling, no mathematics. I was saying yesterday is a wonderful thing. He, he did a lot of mathematics and modeling based on the laws of physics and came up with a simulation that agreed very, very well with the experimental results. So this is the time and this is position of the particle coming in, bouncing off the black mark and coming back. And something else you can do, just, to, just uh, since it's such a nice experiment, this, you can do away with the dark mark, just get rid of it, and instead just have a heat source here, so you just have some kind of thing. You can turn up the temperature, turn it up and down. And uh, what you find is the temperature difference, as you increase the temperature difference, the particle slows down more and more. Usually it gets through okay, but then at a certain temperature difference it comes to a halt. Um, because what you've done here is to have a high enough temperature difference so that the particle comes to, to, a, to a halt due to the light force balancing, being balanced by the airflow force. So you can see it's about 100 degrees is what you need to make this happen. Okay, that was a lot of fun, and it could actually be very useful. If you can simply bring a heat source to a fiber, hold it there, a particle comes along, you can actually stop it there, and you can move it back if you want. You could imagine controlling the position of a particle from outside without having to go in and touch the particle, just using heat. So another quite different topic next, and um, these are all fairly short. This one is fairly short. This one, I call this fatal attraction. Well, actually, I, f I found these funny pictures that are vaguely related to the topic. I don't know if you've seen this movie. I haven't seen the movie. Um, but anyway, mutual attraction of nanowebs, I call this. And this is an optomechanical effect. This is a, an effect, once again, which, in which mechanics is connected to, to light. Um, now, it's well known and there are lots of papers on this in the literature if you're interested in reading about it, but it's well known that if you make two waveguides very close to each other and you launch light into them, then the waveguides get pulled together. There's a force, it's a little bit like the force that traps the particle in the laser beam that I showed you, that these very thin membranes of glass will get pulled together if you launch light into the structure. So the idea of these ex this experiment was to make an optical fiber like this, but instead of having a photonic crystal kind of pattern, we had two very, very thin webs of glass, or membranes of glass. Now, these, these are nanoscale. These webs are less than a micron thick, and the width is about 10 microns, and the length could be 10 meters. So it's a very strange object, difficult to make. Uh, one of the things you can do, just me, let, let me explain how this, how this works. So here's the structure. First thing we do is put some light in, you can work out what the light looks like, the pattern of the light, by solving Maxwell's equations, by solving the equations that describe the behavior of light. 
we can work out the distribution of the light, and then we can work out from this the forces that would act on the on these membranes, on these um, these glass sheets. And it turns out you get a force, an attractive force, pulling them together. The light creates this force. Of course, that's a mechanical force, and this will cause these membranes to distort. They get pushed closer together. And the effect of that is to increase the refractive index effectively in the middle. So we get a refractive index that increases in the middle compared to the edges. And as a result, you form a waveguide. So the, the waveguide, the, the light becomes more, is much better confined in the center of the structure. It's no longer spread out over the whole thing. It ends up in a sort of blob in the middle. So we have a new field distribution. We can then work out the new force distribution caused by the light, the, the force of the light. And we can go around this loop until we reach a stable solution. And when you have, it, have the stable solution, this means that the, 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 the mechanical force that the light produces is exactly right to deflect the webs in such a way as to create that pattern of light in the mode. So it's a kind of self-consistent solution to the optomechanical problem. And you can get self-guidance of light in this way. Okay, that's, that was the original intention of the experiments. We went ahead. It took us two years to work out how to make this. Very difficult to make. But we do use the stack and draw technique I showed you yesterday. So we were able to make a structure with uh, webs which were 400 nanometers thick with a spacing of about 500 nanometers between them. And it guides light pretty nicely in this case because it's slightly thicker in the middle so it forms a waveguide anyway. So here you can see the pattern of the light. Okay, now we didn't look for that self-channeling effect but what we looked for in this case was simply the, the, non, the optical nonlinearity. That's to say... How, how much does the refractive index of this structure change if I increase, as I increase the optical power? Because if I, if I increase the optical power, these membranes get pulled closer together and the refractive index increases. So you have a kind of relationship between the intensity of the light in the structure and the refractive index. You can measure this, and this is the way we do this. We have what's called an interferometer. We have a probe beam which gets split between one path, the reference arm, and the arm where the sample is held and we let them interfere at this end and then uh, stabilize the system and by looking at the interference coming out of this end of the interferometer we can measure the refractive index change in the sample as a function of power and we're driving this with an amplitude modulated pump so the laser, the pump laser is modulated in time with different frequencies. You get some very nice results here. This is the, uh, the signal that we get at the photodiode we get the response, this is the pump light that's modulated going into the system, driving it, and this is the response of the nanoweb structure. We get a, a, a response, the webs are pushed together and pulled apart with a certain amplitude and a certain phase. And we can then modulate the frequency of this drive signal and plot out the result, <coughs> the response of the system, if you like, against the frequency of that drive, that optical drive signal. The frequency range here is around 6 megahertz. One of the things we can do is apply vacuum and remove the air. The air in the, in the structure is going to cause damping. It's also going to make the structure a little stiffer. And this has the effect of making the, uh, a resonant frequency. In fact, the, the, these nanowebs, they have a resonant frequency. There's a certain frequency where they like to resonate. And if you hit the structure at that resonant frequency, you get a very big response. So we tune the frequency, the response goes up a great deal at the resonant frequency and then it comes down afterwards. And as we add more and more air at higher pressures, the, 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 this, this, uh, the damping comes in and you get a much less peaky response. And also the frequency increases because the stiffness of the structure is increasing as a result of that very thin film of air that between the two membranes. So anyway, that's, that's what I wanted to tell you about that particular experiment. Uh, I'm going to, at the end, maybe just mention some applications. This could be interesting as a pressure sensor, amongst other things. So something else completely different, but also to do with mechanics, in a way, to do with mechanics. Uh, it's also got something to do with Mexican waves. Does anyone not know what a Mexican wave is? It's called a totally different thing in different... La Ola wave, it's called in Spain, I think. You, you, know the, you know what I'm talking about, yeah? 
Okay, good. That's important. <laughs> you can even do it here. No, wait till I finish. Yeah, very good. Excellent. Fantastic. <laughs> That's perfect. Perfect. Well, let me tell you, this has something to do with stimulated Raman scattering. You've no idea what that is. Just, but don't worry about it. Because with light, you can force molecules to do a wet Mexican wave. So instead of people, it's molecules that do it. And th this is a process that was discovered by this guy who won a Nobel Prize in 1930, Indian scientist. Um, and he was thinking about what happens when you put some light in to a gas, for it could be a gas, and the molecules of the gas, this, uh, this could be hydrogen or something like that, uh, they're, they're perpetually vibrating. You know, they, 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 they might be vibrating like this, and they might be spinning and doing all sorts of weird and strange mechanical things in a random way. So this is, this is the sort of representation. All these molecules are doing, doing their own thing. They're not talking to each other. They're independently vibrating, um, and uh, there's no, no apparent pattern. You can find many different sort of what looks like waves in this with all kinds of different wavelengths from nanometers to centimeters in this random motion of the molecules vibrating or spinning. Now, each of those molecules, it turns out, if light is coming along and the molecule vibrates, at different parts of that cycle, the light sees a different refractive index. So when the molecule is stretched, you might see a higher refractive index. And when it's compressed, you might see a lower refractive index. So basically, the refractive index that the light sees is modulated because the molecule is vibrating. And this causes phase modulation. It's a bit like what you get in a FM receiver, in a radio receiver, where, where one has to phase modulate a signal to, to put some information onto it. So it's, it's very much like that. Okay. So here we have light comes in, it, gets, it sees the molecules, and what happens is that this light, this laser light, experiences various kinds of scattering depending on the molecule it hits. You can either have frequ a frequency drop to what we call the Stokes frequency, a lower frequency than the frequency of the light coming in. It can also be pushed to a high frequency. We call that the anti-Stokes. These are just jargon terms for what's going on. They, the light can also be reflected into a Stokes and an anti-Stokes photon. But what is magic is that if you turn this power up, turn the laser power up, at some particular point, and I'm going to show you what happens in the case of backward Raman scattering. At a certain pump power, if we put some seed, a very weak seed signal, in the backward direction at the Stokes frequency, you get this amazing thing happening. That the interference between the, the laser light going forwards and the frequency shifted light going backwards creates a pattern of moving fringes. I mean, waves interfere, you know that anyway, I showed you that yesterday. But if one of the waves has a different frequency, then that pattern of interference will move at a certain velocity. And the magic of this process is that the frequency difference between these two, um, these two signals exactly equals the frequency of the molecules. It's the Raman frequency. But by, um, and and then, then by looking at the interference pattern between these two beams, you get a spatial pattern that's moving. And what this pattern does is to force the molecules to follow that pattern with a slight phase difference between them. But the molecules are now being forced to resonate in a coherent way to create a kind of sinusoidal wave, just like a Mexican wave. In fact, that's what I call a Mexican wave. These are molecules doing a Mexican wave. You were doing it a moment ago. Uh, th th this is a, actually a beautiful phenomenon. It's got all sorts of things in it. But one of the things I would like to say about it is, is in particular, is, is that these, this wave can be traveling at close to the speed of light, which is very fast, of course, you know that. But uh, the molecules themselves, these are heavy things, you know. They're not moving anywhere. They're staying exactly where they are. They're simply resonating in a certain phase, and you're creating a kind of ghost wave. It's almost like a ghost wave. Um, the molecules don't move anywhere, but the pattern they create moves and can move at a huge speed. Now, if you were doing your Mexican wave, you could make that Mexican wave move at an enormous speed if you were really good at doing it. You'd have to be pretty quick and so on. But, but, um, but the Mexican wave moves much faster than you do. You're staying in the same place. You're not moving, but you're creating something that is moving. And by doing that, you're, you're able to 
match the velocity of this Mexican wave to the velocity of the fringes of the light. That's what makes this Raman scattering process work. Um, you can do some beautiful things, just one example with this, and the physics of that is what I love, that picture. But here's an example of an experiment we did with this backward Raman uh, experiment. This is the intensity in the frequency shifted light going backwards, and we put in a, a, a seed pulse which has a very peculiar shape. This is actually 25 times brighter than it actually is. This is time, this is the front of the seed pulse, and this is relative time com relative to the front of this seed pulse going in. Seed pulse goes in, it hits the pump wave, and through the interaction with the molecules it gets amplified and it gets reshaped as well. And you can see, see that the, the seed pulse turns into something of quite a reasonable shape. Um, and also just the front end of it is, is amplified. So we can create a short pulse uh, as a result of this backward mechanism. That's quite an interesting uh, effect, um, one of the things you can do with Raman scattering. Okay, my next topic, another strange Hollywood uh, advertisement here, twisted. Twisted in English, when used to describe a person, means someone who's a little bit crazy. You know, so so we're, we're going to twist fibers in this case. I quite like the, the word play in that. So, and the, with these twisted fibers, we're going to put light into orbit, sort of. So let me tell you what I mean here. The kind of optical fiber that we have been playing with here, doing experiments with, is the solid core photonic crystal fiber. If I remind you, this is the one where the core is solid glass. It's surrounded by hollow channels. So as a result, the refractive index of the core is greater than the, that of the cladding, so this structure basically traps light or guides light by total internal reflection. So you put light in, no problem. It's a nice waveguide. What we're going to do here is twist the fiber. We're going to do this to it. Let's look at the picture. This is a representation of the same structure but with a spin produced. So, so these are the hollow channels, these green dots, these yellow things, and the rest of it is the glass. And we're going to do this, so I'll, tell, I'll tell you how we do this in a moment, um, but we're creating a helical distortion of the hollow channels with a pitch, that's a period, a period, that's the length over which it repeats, equal to L, we're going to call that. And you can define a twist rate, that's how many two pi's does this thing ro rotate by per unit length, call that alpha. Uh, this pitch, this length is typically much greater than the actual spacing between the channels, so it's quite a gentle rotation. Um, okay, so that, that's basically the, the structure. And uh, how, how would you, before I tell you what it does, let me show you how we make it. This is a picture of the setup. There's the optical fiber. There's a motor over here. The fiber is held on this side. And while it's spinning, and maybe I can just stop this. My mouse has disappeared. Never mind, it'll repeat. You can see a little white dot there. This is a carbon dioxide laser beam coming in. It's an invisible laser beam at, at wavelength of 10 microns. Um, which heats up the glass very efficiently and softens it. So the, the optical fiber is here, it's heated up, it's softened at that point. Meanwhile, it's being spun at the same time. So you soften the glass and you spin it and you end up then with a permanent twist once you finish the experiment. If you do it correctly, it even guides light. You can even use it. Many, it's quite a difficult thing to do correctly, but it's possible. So we've made a fiber, we've done this, we take it out of the setup, we put it into another setup, and we launch in white light. We launch in one of those supercontinuum spectra that I talked about yesterday. And we look at what happens, how much light comes out of the core of the twisted fiber as a function of wavelength. So this is the visible range. This is green, uh, green to red and then in the infrared. So that's the kind of range we're looking at from 0.5 microns to 1 micron wavelength. If you look at the transmission of the fiber, you see these curious dips appearing. And there's actually one here as well. It's not so clear in this picture. Dip A, B, C, D. I just labeled them for, uh, to make it easier to talk about. They're at a distinct wavelength. It's a very curious thing to see. What could that mean? So you go back into the lab. You make another fiber with a different twist period. This is now 460 instead of 580 micrometers. So we made it shorter. And this time these dips, we can still see A, B, C, D. They have now moved out a longer wavelength. And you do other experiments for different values of L and you find these dips still are there and they've moved to, to different positions. You can do a whole series of experiments and what do you do with those? Well, you take the data and you plot them out. 
So we looked at those dips where the transmission was strangely reduced, and we plot the wavelength at which the dips appear versus the twist rate. That's how fast the fiber is twisting. And you find that, amazingly, these, these are the data points, they lie on perfect straight lines, almost perfect straight lines, and all these lines go through zero when this, on this plot. When I first saw this data, maybe you, you may have done some experiments, I've done lots of experiments, I've almost never seen anything like this. So perfect, it is just, it just, it, I couldn't, just couldn't, I thought there was something wrong, you know, this is, somebody's made a mistake or they're trying to make a joke of me or something, I don't know, but it, I don't know. It is just so amazing to see this, that, uh, that it turned out to be true, and um, there had to be a simple explanation. And this is where physics is so beautiful, that you can, you can find simple explanations for things, especially if the experimental data is telling you something so clear. It's telling you that the wavelength of these resonances is exactly proportional to one over the period of that, of that, twist, of that twist. And it turns out that what we're actually seeing here, without going into too much detail, what we're actually seeing is that this twisted fiber, it's... I don't know if you've seen these, these uh, a screw uh, propeller, which, which looks like a screw, and you rotate it, and it forces the water forwards. It, it makes the water spin you know, you, and pumps it at the same time. It, it, it induces angular momentum on the, on the water, makes it spin. Well, this twisted fiber induces angular momentum on the light. It forces the light to go around in a helical path. And if you look at the analysis of this, basically what we're doing is is sending the light round in a helical path at one particular radius. And if you do that, the light that's going around in the circle, it has to resonate around the circumference. It has to come back, and we say, eat its tail. It's like a snake. It has to come back and eat its tail in a nice way. It, it, it can't do this or this. It has to come back and exactly match. And when you force it to do this, you find that there's a resonance condition that you can derive which relates the twist rate and the radius at which this pattern appears and various other parameters, including the wavelength of the light. A very simple relationship, which exactly matches the fits that we find in the experiment. So the, these lines, in fact, are exactly this theory. So we have a perfect explanation for this. So given that this is what we think is going on, you can then go to the computer and do some numerical modeling and work out that the patterns that the light is taking up in the cladding are quite stunningly beautiful. These are some of the modeling results that we see. And when you look at this, it's even stranger to think that this is spinning as you go along. So this pattern is following the twist of the fiber as it travels along. And this looks so beautiful, I thought I'd show you that. I don't know whether you should look at this for too long, but if you do, you'll find something, something very strange happens whenever you look at the next picture. So this is basically what's going on. Do you get that effect? It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? Okay, here we go. Try the same thing again. So you're actually following the light down the fiber, and your space is doing this the whole time as it travels. And if we stop it, this one goes the other way, no? It's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're making light do the twist. We're making it go into orbit. And by that, I mean the light is going in orbit around the core. Okay, so my final topic today. Once again, a very silly picture from a Hollywood movie, Charlie Sheen. There he is, looking very serious, under pressure. So uh, just because this is under pressure, well, what we're going to do here is, is pump gases under pressure into hollow fiber. And what are, we're doing lots of experiments on this at the moment. It's, it is proving a very exciting area. But one of the results which I think is, is, is going to prove a very, a very important in applications is that we can make a very uh, flexible source of ultraviolet light, tunable ultraviolet light. So let me just remind you from yesterday's lecture that we, we, are, we can sometimes be interested in having very strong nonlinear optical effects in gases or in, or in materials. Now, the, these are the... This is this bit I talked about second harmonic distortion, third harmonic distortion in an audio system. If you turn up the volume too much, you get this horrible bleh, distortion in, in, the, in the audio signal you hear. As a result of the amplifier being pushed too hard, you get a nonlinear response, we call it. That creates new frequencies. We can do just the same thing with light. 
in materials. If you push the material too hard, it uh, responds in a nonlinear way, and you can create new frequencies of light. The analogy is perfect between those two, two systems. You can do the same thing in gases. That's what I want to talk about here. Now, if you want to do this, you want to optimize this effect. So you need to optimize the nonlinearity. And that's provided by the gas in the hollow core. You'd like to optimize the path length, the length over which the light travels. Well, you need low loss for that, which we have in the hollow core fibers. You'd like also to be able to control the chromatic dispersion. That's this business of those Whistler waves or the high frequencies arriving first. You'd like to be able to control that, that, that dispersion as well. Um, and you'd also like to have an area, the area of the core to be as small as possible so that you get a big intensity for a given power level. Remember, the intensity is the amount of power per unit area. So you'd like the area to be small and the power to be big so you have a high intensity. Fiber gives you all these things. Um, the photonic crystal fiber, the hollow core fiber, gives you all these things. If you have a gas-filled hollow core, then you, get, you can get an enhancement in the product of intensity and path length of order 7 million or so. A huge, huge figure. Okay, the fibers we've been doing these experiments with are a particular kind of holocore fiber, which we call a Kagome style uh, holocore fiber. Let me explain why we call this Kagome. Um, it's slightly distorted, but if I put in these lines, these dashed lines, which represent the perfect lattice, you can see there's a little bit of distortion. If I take away the original lattice, you can see that this Kagome lattice pattern is, in fact, it looks like three sets of, of, of planes, of, of Bragg mirrors, set at 128 degrees to each other, uh, 120 de degrees to each other. Um, and in fact, this has a unit cell which looks like a Star of David. If you tile that, you, you get exactly the structure, it turns out. Um, now, the beautiful thing about this particular design is that it gives you very broadband guidance. That's to say, it guides pretty much any wavelength you put into the structure with reasonably low loss. One decibel per meter, by the way, that means that if you have three meters, you lose half the light. The three decibel point, some of you may have heard of, I don't know, but anyway, three decibels mean you, means you lose half the signal. So this is pretty good. You could have three meters to do your experiment. Um, another very nice thing about this fiber is that if you look at the amount of light, the fraction of the light that's actually in the glass, so you can work out the modal pattern and ask, well, how much of this light is actually in the hollow regions and how much of it is in the actual glass? turns out that 99.99% of the light is in the hollow regions and only 0.01% of the light is in the glass. Now this, ha this means that you can put in extremely high powers without damaging the fiber. Because the glass is the thing that gets damaged. The gas doesn't care, you know, it can recover. But the glass, if you, if you, if you destroy it, the fiber will be destroyed. That's very nice. And finally, another thing you can do, and this is the most exciting and wonderful thing about this, this system, is that by changing the pressure of the gas, you can change the chromatic dispersion. I don't, I'm not going to talk about all the details here. All I want to, you to see is that this is dispersion versus uh, frequency or wavelength at the top. And if we change the pressure from zero pressure to 30 atmospheres, so two atmospheres, five atmospheres, and so on, we can change the shape of that curve quite a lot, and we can create zero dispersion wavelengths. That's, those are the wavelengths, if you remember, where the where this uh, Whistler wave didn't whistle. It was simply the lightning strike was, was transmitted as a sharp crack and, and not as a spread of frequencies. So the, this, these blue dots. So we have a very reconfigurable system simply by changing the pressure, simply by putting the fiber under pressure uh, by different, to different degrees, we can change the whole uh, shape of these, of these curves. And this has enabled us to generate tunable ultraviolet light with very high efficiencies, it turns out. And the experiment here is quite simple. We take a length of this Kagome fiber. Here it is, that yellow thing. We connect it to two cells and through which we introduce the gas. So you would, first of all, pump out the air and then introduce the gas you want. The gases we use here are typically gases like argon or krypton or xenon. And we put the laser pulses in, launch them into the fiber, and then look and see what comes out of the other side. So I'm going to show you another video. This time, this is the side view of the fiber between the two gas cells. The pulses are coming in from the left. And, and what, you, what you're going to see here is that as, as the, the energy of the pulses increases with time, so we're steadily increasing the power of the laser light or the energy of the pulses, 
as the energy goes up, you see that see the, the more and more of the fiber lights up with this bluish white color. It starts at the far end and then moves back as the energy of the pulse increases. It's a quite remarkable thing to see in the lab. It's really very bright um, and very strange. I mean, the first time you see it, what could this what could this actually mean? If we now have a look at the diagnostics at what is actually happening here, it turns out that we are generating ultraviolet light. It's coming out of the fiber at the other end with quite high efficiencies, up to 10% of the energy going in is converted to the ultraviolet wavelength. That's actually very high for generating ultraviolet light. It's coming out of a beautiful mode in the core, and it has a bandwidth. You can see this is the ultraviolet wavelength um, of this particular experiment. It turns out this is tunable by changing the pressure of the gas and also the energy of the pulses. Now, you see that, you ask yourself, what could be going on here? You go to the computer, you do some modeling, and there are various complicated equations that you can solve these days um, uh, on the computer. And one of these has to do with the behavior of what are known as solitonic pulses or solitons. Um, if you have a high energy soliton and you launch it into the fiber, so this is the time, so we're looking at relative time, this is the pulse going in, a certain duration, this is distance as it travels. What happens is the pulse goes in and it, 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 the duration of the pulse gets shorter. The pulse gets shorter and shorter and shorter and more and more intense. You can see there's a big spike here at this point. So what's happened is that the pulse which starts with a certain time, as it travels it gets shorter and shorter and peakier and peakier and becomes incredibly intense. And at this point it then starts to break up and you get a kind of uh, pattern, a complicated pattern emerging. And this is for a perfect soliton, an ideal compression event. In our system, our system is not ideal. You don't get an ideal soliton. Instead, what happens is at this point of compression where the pulse is very short and the intensity is very high, we get a process of solitonic fission where the, where the pulse breaks up, the soliton breaks up. We get all sorts of chaotic stuff happening here. But what is really exciting is that we get a band of ultraviolet light emerging. This is the ultraviolet light emerging from this, this, uh, this catastrophic process. It's like a shock that happens inside the gas as a result of this very, very short, very intense pulse. It can even be just two optical cycles long, which is only a few femtoseconds in duration. A femtosecond is a thousandth of a picosecond, which is a thousandth of a nanosecond, which is a thousandth of a microsecond, which is a thousandth of a millisecond. It's a very, very short amount of time. Okay. So let me just show you the experiment again. Here's a, a, a still picture of it. So light comes in, nothing much happens, and at some point you see the, the, the ultraviolet light being generated. This is the temporal focus where the pulse is very, very short. If we run some modeling on this, this is time. You can see the pulse initially is quite broad in time. It's about uh, 30 femtoseconds wide. It gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And down here you have an incredibly short and very intense pulse. This is where all the action happens. This is the ultraviolet light coming off as a function of length. And you can also then plot not, not just the behavior against time, but also the, the bandwidth of the pulse. How many frequencies does the pulse have in it? Initially, it doesn't have so many frequencies, but then as it gets shorter, the, the bandwidth increases because this is what happens. As the pulse gets shorter, you need more frequencies to, to make it short. If it gets longer, you need less frequencies. This is kind of the Fourier principle. And at the point of where the pulse is really short, the bandwidth has, has blown up to an enormous bandwidth, going to maybe this is one petahertz. Petahertz is a thousand... I'm not going through all that again. <laughs> it's a thousand terahertz, a thousand gigahertz, a thousand megahertz, and a thousand kilohertz. Yeah, th these are big numbers, very big numbers and very small numbers. But at this point, you get this deep ultraviolet light generated. Um, we discovered this by chance in the lab, just by playing around. I was sure there was something we'd see interesting in this experiment, and sure enough, they find it. And as a result, we now have, for the first time in the history, I think, of lasers, uh, we have a completely tunable and efficient source of high-frequency light, all the way from the vacuum ultraviolet, below 200 nanometer wavelength, out to the visible. Now, just by changing the gas or changing the pulse energy or changing the pressure, we can do this um, in this very simple short length of, of optical fiber. And I think, I think in the next few years, you're probably going to find that there are commercial products based on this, which will be in the form of a little box you put on the, on the tabletop. 
um, which generate tunable ultraviolet light. You cannot find anything like that at the moment. Um, you can't buy anything like that at the moment. Okay, that was my last topic. So just to conclude, do I have any conclusion? Well, I often get very bored in conclusions. People go through all the things they talked about. Um, I don't want to do that, but, but I'll just put a list up, though, of what I've talked about today. And this is all about what I like to do, which is curiosity-driven research. And my experience is that if you follow your curiosity and try stuff, just to let your imagination free to think about what might happen if I did this or did that, you'll find this leads to important applications. And many, many things that, 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 that you use every day are the result of, of this kind of research. Sadly, there's less and less funding for this these days uh, for various reasons. So this is a list of some of the things I've talked about. Laser-driven particle accelerators, often mechanical nonlinearities, Mexican waves, it's not up there, but anyway, putting light into orbit. This could allow you to make a new kinds of optical sensor in fibers, twist sensors, optical filters. Could be very interesting here, because if you add some more twist, these, these dips will move according to how you mechanically twist it, which is quite interesting, I think. We've got a, a fantastic source of tunable vacuum ultraviolet light. And, of course, not to forget what I talked about yesterday, the, these extraordinary supercontinuum uh, sources, which are already a big commercial hit uh, all over the world. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. And so all I need to do now is thank you for the invitation to the organizers. Thank you for coming along and listening to me. And I hope it was interesting and maybe a little bit enjoyable. So I've enjoyed myself anyway. So.